Colorado's leading all the national newscasts tonight with the latest threat from growing white supremacist violence. Yet today is a good day, not a bad day, according to the head of the Temple Emanuel Congregation in Pueblo. A good day, he tells us, because the FBI got to the man who wanted to start a racial holy war by bombing a small synagogue in southern Colorado. Federal investigators say 27-year-old Richard Holzer from Pueblo admitted to just about everything, said that he was former KKK, a, a white supremacist, a man who wanted to start a race war and instead got federal hate crime charges. The FBI sidled up to him first online, pretending to echo his hate, and after seeing that he was casing that temple, the FBI tested to see how far he wanted to go. He took their dummy pipe bombs and dynamite, according to investigators, who believed that he planned to use them last weekend. Colorado's Anti-Defamation League was also on to this guy years ago. They track online hate as well, trying to figure out who's all just racist talk and who might actually be violent. The ADL says its tracking of the suspect was limited to his postings on white supremacist websites. No specific threats. Now, that synagogue in Pueblo and others have security precautions in place. They know the danger that the state of hate in America presents. That temple in Pueblo holds a memorial to the Tree of Life shootings that killed eight people in Pittsburgh one year ago last week. I do believe that in most synagogues, security has tightened. People have become more aware. Unfortunately, these circumstances have resulted in an atmosphere where we all have to be a lot more concerned about our safety and security. Temple Emanuel is Colorado's second oldest synagogue. It represents a, a rich and often forgotten history of Southern Colorado's Jewish community. I think we just have a, a strong community, a strong membership here, and uh, the people who, uh, who, who come here uh, love this synagogue because of its historic value. And, and uh, because we're basically a family, we're not a, a big congregation, we're a small group of people that come together and pray. And I think that's what keeps people coming and why we've been able to sustain ourselves for 119 years. Temple Emanuel is a small synagogue, 30 families and a rabbi who drives down from Denver every other week. It was on this ground that an admitted white supremacist thought that he could start a racial holy war. Temple Emanuel President Michael Alice Acuna says his small congregation is defiant, but he worries that anti-Semitism is closing in on them from both sides. If I'm concerned about anything, uh, it's not only white supremacy, but I think, you know, the far left and the far right are practically in bed with each other these days because <laughs> they they're both have the same hatred. Sad statement about America today. So we tend to talk about Colorado's low vaccination rates as if there are these strident anti-vaxxers refusing to immunize, immunize their children. Yet when school districts have pushed back, they found that these parents just went and got their kids the shots. Here's Anusha Roy. A couple of Littleton Public School students got an extended weekend. They were not in class today because their families missed a vaccination deadline, a deadline that requires them to either be immunized or sign an exemption by Friday. So these kids will have to stay out of class until their paperwork is updated. There's a similar new deadline coming up for some Boulder families on December 2nd. These districts can change the rules because of an old state law dating back to 1978. Most of those, the laws around vaccination are actually several decades old. Dr. Sean O'Leary, a pediatric infectious disease specialist, He's vaccinated, you know, hundreds if not thousands of kids myself, said Colorado is still at the bottom of the list for vaccination rates. He also said just because the state law was around, enforcing it was another story. Some schools only have enough money for a school nurse once a week. Other families aren't comfortable with vaccinations. And then there's the issue of time. Trying to understand how many of these exemptions are actually exemptions to vaccination versus just they haven't had time to go get their vaccine. It's important for districts to have accurate records because there could be other kids who can't get vaccinated for medical reasons and need to know what they could potentially be exposed to. Now, you know, of course, there are parts of the of the state where it's not always easy to access a, a primary care provider. But after the measles outbreak this year, the conversation changed in places like Boulder, where a spokesman said self-admittedly they were a little too relaxed in enforcing the state law and stepped up their game in the spring. 
So in Boulder, the district said that they know there are a lot of families who are against vaccination, so they're not encouraging people to make one decision over the other, but they just need to know what that decision actually is. Now in Brighton, though, they ended up changing their rules three years ago. That's when they realized that the state law even existed, but did say, though, that those new rules have helped. So we talked to the State Department about why is there this hodgepodge of enforcement across yeah. the state? They said this entire time they have been relying on individual schools and districts to carry out this law on their own. So this is what you get something different depending on where you go to school you get the sense that more school districts are looking at their own action at this point. yeah so the biggest one that we talked today was denver public schools so that yeah. they're revisiting if they need to incorporate a specific deadline but they're just trying to weigh what is the best for their kids right now they can ask a student to go home and work with them to get all that that paperwork up to date you have to think though that they're looking at what's happening in other school districts yep. like what the reaction is and yep. kind of guiding policies based on that yeah a lot of it was looking at what brighton did as mm. well thank you nusha appreciate it State legislators, of course, made, tried to make it tougher for parents to skip vaccines last year, but there was bipartisan resistance to that from everybody from Democratic Governor Jared Polis to conservative lawmakers. Democratic Representative Kyle Mullica from Adams County introduced a bill during the legislature that would not have required vaccines. It just would have made it harder for parents to opt their kids out. He told us he was looking at the idea again. Lawmakers abandoned that proposal a few days before the legislature ended in early May. If you were talking with us on social media this afternoon, you know that our audio board here at the station failed. That's kind of a key component. As we we're trying to figure out how we would do this program this evening without sound. It probably would have limited our ability to do most stories, with one notable exception. Election day is tomorrow. All right, who still needs to fill out a ballot at this point? If you've waited until the last moment, Right now, open it up tonight. Don't wait until tomorrow. Remember, you have to deliver it there. And here's the deal. We know about the two big statewide voter propositions. There's also going to be a number of smaller local issues, so give yourself a little bit of time. If you're still sitting on your ballot because you're thinking, I don't really understand those two statewide issues, let me walk you through them real quick. It's only going to take a second. Prop CC asks voters to give the state permission to keep extra money that it collects from you rather than refunding it back to you under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. This is not your full tax return. It's just the portion under Tabor. That money would then go to road projects and schools. A yes vote allows the state to keep the money. A no vote means it would have to continue to refund the excess. Proposition DD is the other statewide issue. It would legalize sports betting in Colorado. Casinos and sports betting apps would have to pay the state 10% of what they take from Colorado bettors who lose. That tax would fund the state water plan, as well as the regulation of betting and gambling addiction services. A no vote would keep sports betting illegal in Colorado. It would not create that new sports betting tax. There are also 29 cities that have mayoral elections this year, including the city of Aurora, this is the first mayoral election in Aurora since former Mayor Steve Hogan passed away last summer from cancer. It's a nonpartisan election, but everybody's got their views. The front runners are former Congressman Mike Kaufman, a Republican, Omar Montgomery, a Democrat, and Ryan Frazier, a former Republican turned independent. If you didn't like my Cliff Notes version and you want the full Nine News Voter Guide, which also has Marshall Zellinger's stories on those big ballot issues, you can find that voter guide on the next Facebook page. The story there that explains Prop CC also includes specific information on how much money would be refunded to you under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights based on your specific income. We have not seen statewide polling that we feel comfortable with lately on Prop CC, whether it's going to pass or fail. But a mailer that's going out to voters suggested the people who want to hold on to your Tabor refunds are pretty nervous about their chances. Because the mailer from this group, Coloradans for Prosperity, which is backed by big time Democratic uh, donors, is trying to shame people into voting. We have showed you this tactic on Next previously. It's an open piece of mail so anybody around your neighborhood, around your house can see it. And it says, you're not as good about voting as your neighbors. It's targeted at voters that they think are going to vote their way. So they try to shame you into returning a ballot. These Pro Prop CC mailers tell voters to raise their grade by voting. RTD is asking its riders to either endorse the status quo, sometimes unreliable service, or to endorse temporary service cuts due to staffing shortages. RTD put out this new survey today, and it literally frames the choice as option one or option two. That's all you get. And because of that, this survey is going to allow RTD to tell the public you asked for this. 
Now, based on the feedback we get at Next, RTD riders would actually like a functioning transit system, which did not appear to be option one or option two. Getting back to a regular routine after military service can be anything but regular. Many of whom come out of the military mission focused, so they're looking for that next mission. A community college thinks it has a way to help. And wait till you find out how much the state's trip to India will cost you. We're waiting as well. That's next. Democratic Governor Jared Polis is off on his first trade mission for Colorado, spending a week in India along with a half dozen people from the state's Office of Economic Development and International Trade. They're over there talking about renewable energy projects and smart mobility with some investors in India. We are curious how much this trip costs you, the taxpayer. His office told us to check in with them when everybody's back from India. Now, they're counting on us forgetting to do that, but uh, we put up a post-it in the next office. <laughs> A beautiful day, a little cooler as a weak weather system crossed the state, bringing in a bit of a wind shift for us. And that meant temperatures were down about 10 degrees over the highs we enjoyed tomorrow, only to go 10 degrees the other direction as that warm air from the west moves in. A progressive northwest flow of the jet is keeping the really cold air to the north of us. Area of low pressure spinning in the Midwest, and we're seeing these little impulses, little ripples crossing the state. What that means is a little bit of cloud cover. Temperatures will fluctuate a bit, but a quiet week of weather, a week that's more mild than wild for November, one of our snowier months. Although some areas of the northern mountains could see a few light snow showers tonight and tomorrow, but not in Denver. Partly cloudy, a low of 27 tomorrow morning. Temperatures around freezing at the bus stop and then a high close to 60. That's seasonal. Temperatures cool off midweek, warm up at the end of the week, and we're tracking a 20% chance of snow showers Sunday into Monday with cooler weather by about this time next week. And if you're waiting dinner on somebody, a little bit of traffic out there as we look live over I-25 tonight, Kyle. People should try that public transit, I think. Thank you, Kathy. There are veterans who will come home and search for a new mission, a new purpose in life. And that common issue has led the Community College of Denver to open up its first ever Veterans Service Center. Our Nelson Garcia takes us there. Of all the people here, Christian Allord might be the most nervous. Not because he served three years in the U.S. Army. I just want to improve myself. As a person. Not because he's been a student at the Community College of Denver for two years. Well, yes, at the beginning it's, it's hard. It's because he's supposed to speak publicly at this event, unveiling the new Veterans Service Center. And I believe that with the opening of the Veterans Center, they could find the opportunity here at CCD. Opportunity and support. We have like different uh, brochure that can provide help. For veterans who might be nervous about transitioning back to civilian life. After the military, you feel that that you don't belong anywhere else. Not anymore, says college president Dr. Everett Freeman. You know, it's really important for veterans to have a place that they call their home away from home. And that's what this place represents. From something as simple as their own computers and printers to having counselors readily available to talk face to face to a common area to study together. And what the Community College of Denver is doing is standing in the gap for our veterans. And though he has to share the stage with Mayor Michael Hancock, maybe a lord isn't so nervous after all. I believe that this will be a great opportunity for different veterans and other students who are trying to find a, a support. It's an important monumental moment for this college and for the veterans who are here and the veterans who are to come. For next, Yay! I'm Nelson Garcia. The Community College of Denver has more than 200 students right now who are veterans and they expect with this new center, they're going to double that number. We've seen athletes suffer career-ending injuries, but they're not the only ones. I mean, people like to call us like athletes of the fingers. Musicians, their careers can end just as fast as pro athletes. People who get injured from playing, and it happens way more than uh, people outside of music would imagine. That story is next. They play through the pain. They do it because they know that you're watching, you're rooting them on. Not talking about athletes this time. Let's talk about the musicians trying to stay in the game. Our Byron Reed has the story from CU Boulder.
Well, that was certainly a dark story. We'll try to bring that to you later on. The CU's music, Musicians Wellness Program. It's a sign that you better be ready to turn it up if you're headed through this part of town because that is what the sign suggests at Highway 7 in Sheridan. I'm pretty sure that that is, that is not where we want to be headed. Our viewer Karen spotted that. I assume that the signs just come loose up top. I don't know. If you see a sign that makes you do a double take, email it our way with next and I use.com the email address or get our attention with the hashtag hey next. We're just we're going to end the block right now. Okay, we're going to where this is very disappointing for you and me both. Shorts, t-shirts, snow covered trampolines, just another fall week in Colorado. Next. Let's try one more time to bring you that story about how musicians are getting some of the same specialized care that athletes normally get so they can stay playing through the pain. Here's by When it comes to practicing a musical instrument, patience and perseverance are key. Well, I mean, the competitive aspect that's kind of unavoidable when going into the field, but I still will always have the passion for just playing the instrument and making music. Nicole Peters is a junior at CU Boulder, studying musical performance playing the flute, an instrument she's played since she was in grade school. Yeah, I mean, it's the biggest stress reliever. It's also probably my greatest stressor. It's anxiety caused from an early childhood medical condition. I've had severe scoliosis since age seven uh, and it got progressively worse and worse. There you go, excellent. Peter says she had spinal fusion surgery two years ago to help with her breathing. That was because I had scoliosis, everything was sort of shifted and my whole breathing mechanism was crunched. Bring your awareness throughout your system. Now she's part of CU's Musicians Wellness Program, a collaboration of services for music students having trouble playing due to injury, anxiety, or physical tension. They were people who would get injured from playing, and it happens way more than uh, people outside of music would imagine. James Brody is the program's director and says he uses the Alexander technique to get music students thinking differently to develop their overall performance. Basically, it's about how to use yourself in the most efficient way possible to cooperate with gravity instead of fighting against it. You, you weren't quite releasing your abdominal. The goal of the program is to help musicians like Peters. I mean, people like to call us like athletes of the fingers. Keep their composure when they perform. And it's been life-saving for me and I think it's worth everyone taking the time to think about whether it be sitting at the computer or playing a musical instrument. For next, I'm Byron Reed. CU's Musicians Wellness Program works with physicians and mental health professionals. They'll work with seeing and hearing specialists, whatever those music students need to keep playing. The most Colorado thing we've seen today is the yard work that's required after a fall snow around here, but it is nice when the kids are willing to help out with that sort of thing. 12-year-old Luke threw on his shorts and a t-shirt and went out to clear off the trampoline. His mother Debbie shared this photo with us. Share the most Colorado thing you've seen today with the hashtag PayNext or email us at next at 9news.com. Michael in Aurora writes in tonight saying, you are too clean cut. I've heard this before. He, he notes that it's no shave November. I wonder what you'd look like if you didn't shave for 30 days. You should give it a try as it is for a great cause. Well, Michael, longtime viewers of this program will know that we used to participate in uh, no shave November. Uh, the boss didn't like it. Am I allowed to say that? The boss didn't like it. We don't do it anymore because the boss didn't like it. See you next time.